Welcome to Martin Survival. In this series, we're gonna show you how to make an atlatl and dart set. So stick around, we got a great show coming up. All right, folks, so I wanna welcome you back. And the first thing we'll cover is what exactly is an atlatl and dart? Those of you who practice primitive skills and understand the physics behind it, already know this technology and most likely make this stuff and practice with it on a daily basis. Uh, those of you who are just starting to get into primitive skills, this might be foreign to you. So I wanna kinda go over the technology behind this hunting weapon, as well as a little bit of a historical lesson on when the atlatl was used. So the atlatl was used in uh, prehistoric time as well as historic time and evidence as well as archeological examples prove that. Um, it was a, a very, very common weapon of choice to take down larger game animals back in the ice age. So covering the Morongo Basin in Joshua Tree, California specifically, they still find mammoth remains and sometimes with stone points embedded into the bone which is not only fascinating, but it gives a historical perspective on how things were done in prehistoric times. So they would take these long darts, like you see here, and they would take an atlatl. This is a Woomera style atlatl, Australian Aboriginal. And you would have a hook at the end of the atlatl, and then you'd have a hollowed out section on the dart. They'd insert that hollowed out section into the atlatl. They would stand back and they would throw it. And the atlatl has much more momentum and much more drive as well as impact than a bow and arrow. So it's ideal for hunting mammoth and it was ideal for hunting these large game animals. And not one person would throw a whole bunch of darts into a mammoth. You'd have a whole group of tribesmen who would hunt these large game animals and they'd throw these darts into the mammoth and pin cushion it until it fell to its death. So that was back in historic or prehistoric times, excuse me. In more recent times in the basket maker culture, they still use them. This is a basket maker style atlatl. Same thing with this. And uh, you can see we have a nice little bend to it. Same thing with this atlatl, and that was very typical for a basket maker style atlatl. So in prehistoric times, the atlatl looked very basic. As a matter of fact, some folks will compare it to looking like a branch of a pine, uh, a pine tree or, or, or uh, an ash tree, just for an example. But as time went by, they started incorporating more technology behind the atlatl in order for it to become much more efficient. But as time started going by, the animals of course shrunk down in size, so then they started migrating towards the bow and arrow, which we see a lot of today, which is very, very practical because we're not hunting these large mammoths like they were in prehistoric times. But the atlatl is a very interesting tool and people still hunt with it. Um, Atlatl Bob is one of the most talented guys in throwing the atlatl and dart. He has the theory down, he has the, the physics, as well as the technology perfected in this hunting weapon of choice. I was watching a television program, um, I think it was called I Caveman, and this was maybe five, four or five years ago. and. Uh, they, they worked as a tribe to hunt elk. And the means of killing the elk was in fact used with an atlatl and dart. So it can still be done. And a lot of folks will use this as a replacement from a bow and arrow. But again, the atlatl has much more drive. It has much more momentum and much more impact than a bow and arrow that has a lot of speed. So the question now becomes, is hunting with an atlatl and dart a practical means of securing meat in today's day and age when our technology is so far advanced? And the answer to that is it depends on the hunter. Like I said, there's guys that I know that still take large game as well as medium sized game animals with this technology. They have a great understanding of the physics behind it and they get in that mindset of the animal and they still hunt with these tools. 
and it's just amazing watching them hunt uh, with an atlatl and dart. I find it quite fascinating. However, I like to hunt with a traditional bow and arrow. I find it to be a little bit more practical since, like I said, the animals have shrunk down in size. It's faster and it's more stealth-like, meaning there's less movement compared to throwing this atlatl and dart and always having to stand up when doing so. But one would even argue my way of hunting. And, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's folks that'll say, why would you hunt with a traditional bow and arrow when we have these Ruger Scout 308 rifles available that'll quickly kill an animal and you don't have to move at all. And I like hunting with the traditional bow and arrow because it brings me closer to the land. I've used natural materials that I've gathered in the environment and I've made a special connection to not only the materials that I'm using, but to the earth that I'm standing on. So again, it's just a matter of personal preference. So at this time, I'd like to explain some of the materials that you can use to construct an atlatl and dart. And I'm also gonna go over the materials that I'm going to use in this series to do so. Now the first thing we want to cover is the atlatl itself. And when I make an atlatl, I use hard wood. I tend to stay away from softer woods like cottonwood and aspen, which is found in this area unless I'm forced to use them. But almost everywhere I go, I find hard wood. Out here, we have a lot of mahogany, which is a great wood to work with. Uh, this atlatl right here is a piece of red oak and you can see again we have a bend to it this is that basket maker style and a lot of the traditional natives would use oak because of its simplicity to make heat corrections and, and make bends like you see here and it was very common to use oak for the rabbit sticks another thing i want to add um, with the atlatl is when you do use these harder woods it is beneficial for the dart itself. It's going to ultimately add weight into the atlatl, which in return will help stabilize that dart in flight. So this basket maker style atlatl <clears throat> is made of honey locusts. Again, we have that wooden spur like all of my atlatls. Uh, as far as the spur, we'll go into that a little bit later. Uh, you can use alternative materials like antler tines. I've used those as well. This atlatl right here, the Woomera style atlatl, is a piece of cherry and you can see I have a red mahogany stain on it. <clears throat> this one we don't have any bend whatsoever and that's also okay. The atlatl that we're going to construct in this series will be made of mahogany. So you can see that this is a really dense hard piece of wood. I still got a lot of weight to remove which we'll start doing so in the next part of the video. Now moving on to darts. <clears throat> this dart right here is of sandbar willow and sandbar willow is really flexible and that's what you want with a dart. You want there to be flex in the air. And uh, we have, um, of course we have it finished. We have turkey feathers up top, uh, red paint up top, it's sinew wrapped. And then I also have a removable foreshaft. And that's what I use with all of my darts, even my arrows. I think it's a very practical way of hunting. Again, it's nothing new. <clears throat> if we look throughout time, a lot of the natives that even occupied this land that I'm standing on today would use these removable foreshafts. Here's another piece of sandbar willow. This one has a lot of mass to reduce. It's still very, very thick. This is a shorter dart. So in return with a shorter dart, I'm gonna get more speed. If I make a longer dart, I am going to sacrifice the speed and get more momentum. So this is a piece of mule fat. You can also use arrowweed. This is a piece of arrowweed. We're going to use this piece of arrowweed for the foreshaft when we construct our dart, but you can make the entire dart of arrowweed. The problem with arrowweed is treating it. Once you, once you harvest the arrowweed, it tends to crack and split. I've had pieces split from one end all the way down to the other. 
So you have to use animal fat to help seal it and even doing so, you'll get some splitting. I have some splitting on this piece right here. Um, so that's very typical of vera weed. Usually I harvest 25 to 30 shoots of vera weed and honestly about 10 survive. So it's, uh, it's kind of hit or miss. The Mojave, as far as I understood, they used to burn the fields of arrowweed to help dry it out, and then they would come back and they would harvest the, uh, the material. This is a piece of bamboo. This is a hard wood, much like the arrowweed. It does have some flexibility to it. And again, all of the material that I'm using when constructing this stuff, I wanna make sure it's nice and flexible. We can also use creosote, or some folks will call this greasewood for our foreshaft. So much like arrowweed, this is a hard wood, and you wanna use a hard wood for your removable foreshaft due to the fact that this is the first object that is going to hit that target, and then all of the momentum follows it. So we want that hard wood to help withstand all of that momentum going into our target. So now we are going to go ahead and start shaping this atlatl out and we're gonna start removing mass.